Um, good morning to everyone and welcome to this special event. And we will soon be speaking with two American astronauts direct from the International Space Station. Through satellite communications, NASA astronaut Scott Kelly and Cheryl Lindgren will join us by video link and spend the next 20 minutes with us. For over 15 years, NASA astronauts have lived and worked on board the International Space Station, perhaps the greatest engineering achievement in human history. The space station is in orbit 240 miles above the Earth and is traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, about five times faster than the highest velocity bullet. It is roughly the size of a football field and weighs almost a million pounds. It has more livable space than a six-bedroom house, along with science laboratories that allow astronauts to live and work there. The six astronauts currently on board include two Americans, three Russians, and one from Japan. NASA astronauts Scott Kelly and Shell Lindgren will speak to us today from Destiny Lab, where they are conducting scientific experiments using the unique zero-gravity conditions in space. Aboard the space station laboratory, we can develop new materials and medicines that make their way into the commercial products used here on Earth. Some examples of this research are on display this morning around the hearing room. The technology spinoffs from America's space program have significantly impacted our economy and improved our way of life, from the microchips in our computers to lightweight metal alloys used in our cars to touchpad screens on our iPads. More importantly, the space station is a place to test new technologies that could assist future astronauts, for example, when they venture to Mars. NASA astronaut Scott Kelly and Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko are currently on a one-year mission on board the International Space Station. A veteran of three space flights before his current mission, Scott Kelly holds the record for the most time any American has spent in space. As of today, he has been in space a total of 430 days. We also will be speaking uh, with Dr. Chell Lindgren on board the International Space Station. He is a medical doctor who joined NASA in June 2009, and he is on his first space mission. Astronauts serve as role models who inspire students to study science, math, and engineering. They also appeal to all generations and entice us to seek answers to timeless questions about life, our existence, and the meaning of it all. To that end, I am told that NanoRocks, one of our exhibitors this morning, is announcing a new educational initiative today in conjunction with this event. Dream Up will be a new company dedicated solely to educational space research that leverages NanoRocks expertise in providing hands-on experience for students in getting their experiments into space. Uh, we also greatly thank NASA and the Johnson Space Center for helping us set up the downlink today and also the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space from Florida's Space Coast for showcasing their work here, too. I now recognize the ranking member, Eddie Bernice Johnson from Texas, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to all. I look forward to uh, this morning's downlink and the chance to hear from our NASA astronauts about life aboard the International Space Station and the challenges and opportunities they face. As you know, last month, we celebrated the 15th anniversary of continuously occupying the International Space Station. I want to again congratulate NASA and its partners on this significant accomplishment. The space station is playing a critical role in advancing scientific research, preparing for future human spaceflight initiatives, and inspiring the next generation. I wish more of our young people could see the wonderful exhibits in this room. I have no doubt that they would be inspired to develop their own science projects that might one day fly on the station. Mr. Chairman, realizing our dreams to send humans beyond low Earth orbit and eventually to Mars and back will depend greatly on the research we conduct on the space station. As you just said, Commander Scott Kelly is spending a year living and working ab aboard the International Space Station to help scientists better understand how the human body reacts and adapts to the harsh environment of space. This is but one example of the ways in which the International Space Station provides a unique environment for research. Yet, 
As we heard at the hearing, a space subcommittee held a few months ago on an operational challenge in facing the space station. Keeping the station a productive orbiting facility is not easy. The recent cargo resupply mission failures are stark reminders of the risk and challenges that NASA and its partners face in operating and maintaining the station. That is why we must never lose sight of why we are making our national investment in the space station in the first place. We need to ensure that for however long we're able to operate it, we can do so in a way that maximizes its productivity and its contribution to cutting edge research. The astronauts we will hear from in a few minutes are on the front lines of that endeavor and I look forward to hearing from them. And I thank you and yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. A uh, couple of uh, ground rules here uh, or suggestions. Uh, each side is going to have a total of 10 minutes, so we will be keeping track of that. And I'd like to encourage members to limit their questions, if possible, to 30 seconds so that we'll be able to squeeze in as many questions as possible. Uh, typically, the astronauts will use up a minute or, minute or two in their uh, responses. Uh, also, a little bit of a reminder, the um, it takes several seconds for our questions to get to the space station and for their answers to get back to us. So that when you get ready to ask a question, uh, push the uh, button uh, in front of you that uh, makes your mic go live, but wait a couple of seconds before you start your question, and then when you finish, uh, push off the button so the astronauts don't get any feedback. Uh, so things are a little bit in slow motion. It takes two or three seconds for the sound to uh, be transmitted to the station and, and to receive it back. Uh, that's about it. Uh, without wanting to embarrass anybody, just so everybody knows what I know, my eyes are going to be on the gentleman to my right in the corner with the blue sweater vest. Uh, he is going to give us a five-minute warning and a one-minute warning. And so as soon as we get the signal, uh, we're not yet to five minutes, but we are going live with the downlink, we believe, at exactly 10.15, and we'll be live from 10.15 uh, to 10.35. So uh, we've got a five minutes or six minutes now. I hesitate to have open mics, but if anybody has anything they must uh, share, uh, now would be the time to do so. Okay, this, this is the quietest members of Congress have been in a long time. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to announce that in the audience today Good. are members, uh, students from St. Thomas More Cathedral School in my district here in Northern Virginia. And they're here because they spent the last couple of years developing their own CubeSat, <clears throat> which will be on the a future mission to the space station. Oh, excellent. It will be deployed in low Earth orbit with uh, two cameras mm -hmm. and radio, and schools around the world will be able to download the data, the photos, from these students' projects, so. Excellent. Uh, they, they were just in a science fair. They were the only elementary school in the science fair. Why don't we ask them to raise their hands? Yeah, if they, well, yes, you can stand up and wave. Okay. And so we have fu future astronauts and astrophysicists and engineers. Here. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good use of our time. Any other announcements? Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I represent uh, Livermore, California, which has two national laboratories. We believe the most amount of physicists in the country. Despite that, they still elected me to Congress. Uh, but in my district, I asked uh, our students to uh, pose some questions for the astronauts. We won't be able to ask all of them, but we had over 100 uh, responses on social media from elementary schools across the district, and so I just wanted to thank uh, my constituents for. Uh, I, did, such I did the same. Great participation. I did the same thing. In fact, I'll be mentioning it in a minute, and I'm. It's, it's pretty tough selecting one question from the hundred you get, but uh, um, it's nice to have that kind of response from back home as well for both of us. I think. So, any other comments over here? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, we, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster. Yeah, um, we did the same in the Illinois 11th District, and um, uh, the the good folks at NASA saw fit to retweet our announcement uh, from their their main ISS wow. website. As a result, we were inundated with requests for questions from all over the world, <laughs> uh, in places like Madagascar and you name it. Um, and unfortunately, we're having to restrict the questions that I'll be asking only to those students in the Illinois 11th District. I totally. <laughs> Totally understand, but again, nice to see the interest uh, regardless. Um, 
we should have gotten a five-minute warning, not yet. We did. Oh, we did get a five-minute warning, okay. Maybe give us a three and a one, just so we won't get caught off guard here. Mr. Chairman. Yes, the gentleman from Colorado. Thank you, I'd oh, just like to uh, acknowledge uh, gentleman Dr. Z from uh, University of Colorado, who is here today. He has one of the displays over there, and as you guys all know, I love to brag about my state. And uh, I'm gonna get to ask a question of Dr. Lingren, who ha went to the Air Force Academy, Colorado State University, and the University of Colorado. So we're very well represented here that today. Excellent, okay, good to know. Where is he again? If he is there, okay, great. Three degrees from the University of Colorado? Well, Dr. Lindgren has three, three degrees. degrees from different institutions in Colorado. Dr. Z is a um, right. uh, doctor, got his PhD at the University of Colorado, has experiments on the uh, laboratory. Okay. Good, good. I need a list of numerators. Three. Okay. three minute, okay, we've had a three minute warning. A uh, gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bridenstine. I'll be real quick since we're now bragging about our state. Uh, <laughs> like uh, everybody to know that the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, from whence I hail, uh, built all 11 truss structures on the International Space Station. Ah. And we built the devices that maneuver the solar arrays on the International Space Station. So this is exciting for us from Tulsa. Great. Great. As, as, long, as, long as, <laughs> as long as they're bragging about our commonwealths, um, ah. I'd like to point out that, that, that Dr. Lindgren, who uh, uh, will be talking to us in a minute, uh, went to the governor's school in, in Virginia when I was lieutenant governor, and I think I spoke at his high school graduation. I, and, yeah. <laughs> Are you going to remind him of that? Or, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. I have something to the, share. Yes, the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. I saw the Martian over the <laughs> holiday. <laughs> By the way, both of our astronauts have watched the Martian in the space station. Mr. Chairman, uh, from, from the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, just want to acknowledge uh, I had students in Malden, Massachusetts that competed in a national robotics competition that took place on the space station and came in number one in the country. Just want to Excellent. acknowledge Mr. them. A uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Babin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a, the, the congressman representing the Johnson Space Center. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to and pass if, that up. If Oklahoma's going to brag, Texas has got to brag as well. <laughs> Okay, we are less than a minute away. Okay, so. I just wanted to say that uh, I, had, I got, had the privilege of meeting with, uh, with Captain Kelly uh, just uh, a few weeks before he launched uh, on this mission. And uh, all Houston is watching, and I uh, just want to say great, uh, good congratulations to him and uh, appreciate NASA's all, all their hard work in this thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're about there. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. This is Mission Control, Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Right. Uh, station, this is Science, Space, and Technology Committee Chairman Lamar Smith. How do you read me? We re read you loud and clear, sir, and uh, welcome aboard your space station. Captain Kelly and uh, Dr. Lindgren, thank you very, very much for spending 20 minutes with us today. We have a number of members of Congress right here eager to ask you questions, and we're going to keep our questions short to try to get as many in as possible, and I'll start off. Uh, I had a number of questions submitted by schools and students back home in my congressional district in Texas. I selected one from the Winston School in San Antonio, and that question, just to be directed to both of you, is what should students study if they want to work for NASA or become an astronaut?
Well, sir, NASA is a pretty large organization, and there's, uh, you know, there's all different uh, different fields um, that uh, our employees have backgrounds in. But I think, you know, with specific specifically, you're talking about like engineering and science, and you know, as an astronaut, you have to have a background in in those kind of fields, um, some type of technical degree. Um, you know, there's a lot of confusion. A lot, a lot of times, people think you know most of the astronauts come from the military, and that's not not true. Um, we have, you know, probably an equal mix in our office of civilian and, and military personnel. But I think one thing they have in common is really uh, you know good performance in their chosen uh, technical field, and then a really diverse um, you know varied background of of the other things that they do. That's not you know, part of their professional life. And what I tell kids is, you know, they should pick something that they something that they like and something they're interested in because they're better uh, or more likely to do well at it. And, and I would, uh, sir, I'd just add um, to, to what uh, Scott said, that uh, when, when I talk to kids um, that want to, to pursue a career in, uh, in space flight and specifically to, to get to come up here and explore with us, that... Um, that they need to, to really focus on on the science and math and and those sorts of things because that is the the language of uh, space flight and okay. uh, and they need to be fluent. Thank you very much. The ranking member is recognized. Thank you very much, Dr. Lindgren. As a former nurse, I'm thrilled to see a former emergency medicine practitioner above the station. And. Is NASA leveraging your expertise in medicine and physiology to reduce the risk for long-term space and travel? And Commander Kelly, thank you as well for being there. Thank you for that question, ma'am, and thank you for your, your service uh, as a nurse. Um, I think that uh, NASA, you know, when we, we are selected, we, we definitely take um, individuals from a variety of career fields and so I feel very fortunate to, to represent uh, the biomedical and, and healthcare professions uh, in the, the astronaut office and uh, I think that uh, we certainly um, I, I certainly util utilize my background in terms of uh, uh, teamwork and good communication uh, being able to work under um, difficult conditions those all, all of the, that uh, training has benefited me up here uh, speaking specifically to the, the biomedical research and um, identifying uh, areas and experiments where we can uh, help help folks on the ground. You know, we have a whole suite of experiments up here, 240 sp experiments during the time that I hear, I'm i here, and I think uh, Scott will have seen 400 different uh, research projects so during his year up here. And many of those are biomedical in nature, looking at um, uh, bone loss, muscle wasting, um, immune system dysfunction. And uh, we have uh, a project that was up here um, that Scott got to work on with uh, mice, uh, a rodent research. Us uh, identify areas where we can bring results from up here to benefit uh, folks back on the ground. Uh, thank you, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hulkman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you both for your service. We are so grateful. Uh, Captain Kelly, Dr. Lindgren, uh, great to have you with us in our committee today. I talked to my uh, local expert, my 11-year-old son, Cole, uh, to ask him a question he would want to ask you. One question was, uh, if you know what continent you're, continent you're over right now or how fast you circumvent the globe, uh, and then also what experiment or project you're most excited about that you're working on right now. So uh, right now we're over the uh, the southern part of South America and we're heading uh, across the Atlantic and uh, soon to be over Southern Africa and then up into Europe. And it takes us uh, at 17,500 miles an hour. It takes us 90 minutes to go around the earth one time. So we're going pretty fast. And um, as far as projects that, uh, that I'm excited about, um, you know, we do so much on board here um, between like the spacewalks that Chell and I just did to robotics activities. We have a visiting vehicle uh, coming on Sunday, should launch tomorrow, the uh, Orbital Sciences uh, uh, cargo vehicle. We're excited about that. And then the, all the research that we do and the research is in uh, all kinds of different uh, 
the categories, whether it's uh, research that's focused on future exploration um, or research that is focused on, um, you know, improving life on Earth. And, you know, both of those are in all different kinds of disciplines, whether it's uh, medical stuff or, um, you know, for instance, the life support system here and how we, you know, uh, replenish the environment of oxygen, scrub it uh, of carbon dioxide create uh, water from our urine, use that water to produce oxygen, is something that's very important for exploration. And for me, you know, all that stuff is exciting in, uh, in different ways. But I think, um, you know, the one thing that excites uh, me the most uh, for this particular flight is the, the idea of being up here for a year and expanding the envelope about, you know, how people can live and work in space for longer periods of time because that's what it's going to take. Uh, understanding that better for us to, to you know, travel further from our planet and hopefully one day go to Mars. The gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. Uh, thank you, Commander Kelly, Dr. Lindgren. Uh, really appreciate your service and your being here with us today. Um, Commander Kelly, I understand that you have tried the outrageous romaine lettuce, and I wonder if you could tell us about the challenges of uh, growing and developing a food supply and what that tells you about the things that we need to know if we're thinking about long-term extended stay and visits to Mars. Um, that's a, a tough question you ask. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, I don't quite understand the logistics train of, of going to Mars and, and at what point it's more efficient to uh, grow your own food, you know, exactly the point where it's more efficient to grow your own food with the resources you need to do that versus maybe pre-positioning food there. Um, but, you know, with the food we had on board here, it, it besides the nutrition and the, the freshness of it, there are other things that it does provide. I mean, we live in, a, in an environment here now that is just pretty much devoid of life except for us. So, you know, there's the nutritional aspect of it, but also there's the psychological aspect about having something else, you know, green up here that's uh, that's living, that we can uh, take care of, that we can see grow, and that we can, you know, utilize uh, later as food. Um, right now we're growing flowers, actually, and, you know, obviously we're not going to eat those, but, uh, you know, it's it's to demonstrate our ability to grow something else and also to see, you know, what effect that may have on us from a psychological standpoint. One of the things I really miss up here, besides, you know, human contact and the, you know, my friends and family on Earth, which is pretty much the number one thing I miss, is the ability to be outside and to experience nature. nature. And I think having a, uh, you know, ability to grow, um, whether it's something you're going to eat or something you're going to look at or something that's going to help replenish our, you know, our atmosphere that we're, you know, that we require for life uh, is something that's very important. And I think it does have a, uh, a definite place in the uh, future and our, our journey to Mars. Uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Bridenstine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our astronauts. <clears throat> I wanted to ask a question. There's a growing concern among members on this committee about the orbital debris problem that's in low Earth orbit. And I wanted to ask a question about um, some of the precautionary measures. I know that they're remote and the probability is low, but uh, can you share with us what your precautionary measures are and also how often they occur and if it impacts your ability to do your work on the space station? Yes, sir. So uh, that's a, a pretty uh, complicated problem. And, you know, when you see the graphics, you see all the stuff that's uh, flying around the Earth, the space junk. And, you know, Chell and I just recently went outside, and you can see all the little dings on the outside of the space station. They're all over the place from stuff that's hit the station. Now, fortunately, you know, most of that stuff is small and uh, hasn't done any significant damage, but there is damage done, and there's obviously the chance of... Uh, uh, more significant damage. There's shielding on many parts of the space station outside that will prevent, um, you know, some kind of catastrophic uh, impact from small things and uh, and things in orbit. Stuff that's uh, you know coming from, you know, deep space is 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 going much faster and pre presents even a larger problem. But there's really nothing we can do about about that. Um, occasionally, we have to move the space station. 
Um, we've probably done it since I've been up here maybe, I don't know, maybe five times. Um, you know, the U.S. Air Force can track a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff, but some st stuff they can't see. Some stuff we see very late. And we had a case where, uh, you know, I had to close all, I, I don't know, maybe 20 hatches on the U.S. side of the space station. And we had to go down to the Russian Soyuz. And, uh, you know, the time of uh, closest approach to pass because we didn't have time to move the space station. So there is, uh, you know, there are things we can do to mitigate, mitigate the risk. Uh, with shielding, with moving the space station, with sheltering in place, should we not have the, the time to do that? But I think, I think you know, space is very important. Um, you know, technology today relies on it, and I think we really need to protect the uh, the environment that our satellites uh, fly in, and uh, you know, by not creating any more debris, and you know potentially looking at ways to reduce the debris that uh, currently exists because that is such a critical capability uh, for our nation and for the world. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Byer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Commander and, and Doctor. Thank you so much for your heroic service, for stretching our imagination and all of our science. We have a complicated relationship with Russia right now, difficult geopolitical situation. How is it going with your Russian colleagues? And, do you share all of your data with them, and are they reciprocating with us? Yeah, so, you know, Russia's really been a great partner uh, for us on this space station, and that's one of the things that um, is great about this program. Uh, you know, besides the, the research value and the, you know, the exploration um, capability it provides, uh, you know, the international partnership and the, uh, uh, you know, providing a place and, a, uh, and goals and, um, you know, a program for us to work on jointly with other nations has been really one of the, you know, the shining uh, points of this uh, space station, you know, relationship uh, that we've had. As far as the cosmonauts and them specifically, you know, we rely on each other for our lives. And, you know, we have to count on one another, whether it's, you know, them counting on us, on us, us counting on them, our other international partners. So, you know, any difficulties that are, and conflict that our, our countries experience is something that, you know, although we recognize that there's, that stuff goes on and occasionally we talk about it, it doesn't affect our relationship up here because, you know, we're all professionals. We understand the reality of, you know, having to rely on one another. You know, I'll be up here with, uh, you know, when these guys leave here next week, I'll be up here with two cosmonauts for, you know, five days. I was up here as the only, uh, with two Russian guys for six weeks in the summer. And if there was something that was to happen to me, any kind of medical emergency, those guys would be my doctor. I mean, I have to really, uh, count on them for my my life and uh, you know vice versa so you know we have a great relationship and I think the the international aspect of this program has really been one of the highlights of it the gentleman from Johnson Space Center mr. Babin this is dr. Brian Babin and you and I met uh, <clears throat> Scott uh, just a few weeks before you launched we we uh, had a great visit at Johnson Space Center I got to talk with uh, Dr. Jeff Davis, uh, who was doing some of the uh, experiments and uh, the comparisons between you and your, your brother, Mark. And I am a dentist, and uh, I try to, uh, I still have a, a great interest in my, my, my profession, and I wanted to find out, uh, I know your, your partner, I just wanted to thank him too as well, Dr. Lundgren. Uh, Lindgren, I, I appreciate your service. I wanted to ask you, uh, both of you, what your oral health uh, situation is, and also your general health uh, uh, from your long-term exposure to uh, to weightlessness and zero gravity, and have you had any uh, situations where you've had a problem there, and do you have any long-term uh, concerns about that? And again, thank you so very, very much. Well, thank you for the question, sir. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the philosophy of our medical care system is really one of prevention and identifying uh, the healthiest people possible um, to select into the astronaut office. 
uh, to, to make it most desirable to, to get the affected crew member uh, available of health. Good preventive practice for long duration uh, mission as well. I regret we only have time for one more question. Quick question, and that goes to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. Thank you, and gentlemen, thank you for your, your service to the nation and to the future. And my question is, and I'm very happy, Dr. Lindgren, you've got so many degrees from institutions in Colorado. My question, we heard in a panel uh, a couple weeks ago that the planets line up in 2033. That's the best time to get our astronauts to Mars. Do you guys think that's feasible? Well, I think, um, I, mean, I personally think it's feasible. Um, you know, there's still things we need to learn, but I think we've learned a lot uh, from this space station uh, and our experience in space. And I think, um, you know, the long pole in, our, in the tent, so to speak, for going to Mars is the, uh, you know, the support of, uh, you know, the nation, the, the support of our uh, representatives in government, and, of course, the money. I mean, it's expensive, and we have, uh, you know, different priorities. But I think it's a, a trip that is, uh, you know, is worth the investment. I think there are, uh, you know, there are things tangible and intangible we get from investing in space flight, and I think Mars is a... Uh, you know, a great goal for us, and I definitely think it's achievable. Uh, Captain Kelly and Dr. Lindgren, we're out of time, but we appreciate the 20 minutes you have spent with us today. Uh, we certainly wish you well and look forward to your safe return to Earth. Thank you all again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for your time, and uh, we we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, and we also wanted to wish uh, Congresswoman Johnson a happy birthday. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Smith and committee members. Station, we're now resuming operational comm. That was actually an early birthday present. The actual birthday, I'm just told, is tomorrow, but, <laughs> but close enough for government work. So in any case, uh, I want to thank, thank all the members for joining us here today. Feel free to take a look at the exhibits. Uh, again, we want to thank NASA and Johnson Space Center for making this downlink uh, possible, and we stand adjourned. Our students to study science, math, and engineering. They also appeal to all generations and entice us to seek answers to timeless questions about life, our existence, and the meaning of it all. To that end, I am told that NanoRocks, one of our exhibitors this morning, is announcing a new educational initiative today in conjunction with this event. Dream Up will be a new company dedicated solely to educational space research that leverages NanoRocks expertise in providing hands-on experience for students in getting their experiments into space. Uh, we also greatly thank NASA and the Johnson Space Center for helping us set up the downlink today, and also the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space from Florida's Space Coast for showcasing their work here, too. I now recognize the ranking member, Eddie Bernice Johnson from Texas, for her opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to all. I look forward to uh, this morning's downlink and the chance to hear from our NASA astronauts about life aboard the International Space Station and the challenges and opportunities they face. As you know, last month, we celebrated the 15th anniversary of continuously occupying the International Space Station. I want to again congratulate NASA and its partners on this significant accomplishment. The space station is playing a critical role in advancing scientific research, preparing for future human spaceflight initiatives, and inspiring the next generation. I wish more of our young people could see the wonderful exhibits in this room. I have no doubt that they would be inspired to develop their own science projects that might one day fly on the station. Mr. Chairman, realizing our dreams to send humans beyond low Earth orbit and eventually to Mars and back will depend greatly on the research we conduct on the space station. As you just said, Commander Scott K uh, Kelly 
is spending a year living and working ab aboard the International Space Station to help scientists better understand how the human body reacts and adapts to the harsh environment of space. This is but one example of the ways in which the International Space Station provides a unique environment for research. Yet, as we... New materials and medicines that make their way into the commercial products used here on Earth. Some examples of this research are on display this morning around the hearing room. The technology spinoffs from America's space program have significantly impacted our economy and improved our way of life, from the microchips in our computers to lightweight metal alloys used in our cars to touchpad screens on our iPads. More importantly, the space station is a place to test new technologies that could assist future astronauts, for example, when they venture to Mars. NASA astronaut Scott Kelly and Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Kornienko are currently on a one-year mission on board the International Space Station. A veteran of three space flights before his current mission, Scott Kelly holds the record for the most time any American has spent in space. As of today, he has been in space a total of 430 days. We also will be speaking uh, with Dr. Shell Lindgren on board the International Space Station. He is a medical doctor who joined NASA in June 2009, and he is on his first space mission. Astronauts serve as role models who inspire... heard at the hearing a space subcommittee held a few months ago on an operational challenge in facing the space station. Keeping the station a productive orbiting facility is not easy. The recent cargo resupply mission failures are stark reminders of the risk and challenges that NASA and its partners face in operating and maintaining the station. That is why we must never lose sight of why we are making our national investment in the space station in the first place. We need to ensure that for however long we're able to operate it, we can do so in a way that maximizes its productivity and its contribution to cutting edge research. The astronauts we will hear from in a few minutes are on the front lines of that endeavor, and I look forward to hearing from them. And I thank you and yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Johnson. A uh, couple of uh, ground rules here or suggestions. Uh, each side is going to have a total of 10 minutes, so we will be keeping track of that. And I'd like to encourage members to limit their questions, if possible, to 30 um, Good morning to everyone, and welcome to this special event. And we will soon be speaking with two American astronauts direct from the International Space Station. Through satellite communications, NASA astronaut Scott Kelly and Shell Lindgren will join us by video link and spend the next 20 minutes with us. For over 15 years, NASA astronauts have lived and worked on board the International Space Station, perhaps the greatest engineering achievement in human history. The space station is in orbit 240 miles above the Earth and is traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, about five times faster than the highest velocity bullet. It is roughly the size of a football field and weighs almost a million pounds. It has more livable space than a six-bedroom house, along with science laboratories that allow astronauts to live and work there. The six astronauts currently on board include two Americans, three Russians, and one from Japan. NASA astronaut Scott Kelly and Shell Lindgren will speak to us today from Destiny Lab, where they are conducting scientific experiments using the unique zero-gravity conditions in space. Aboard the space station laboratory, we can develop 